much. Um, uh, I will go right into it. Uh, our, <coughs> our case study site Bora is located in the south of Norway um, at the western shoreline of the Oslo Fjord um, in Vestfold County, which also accommodates uh, some very famous Iron Age and Viking Age sites in this area, Kaupang, Goksat, Roseberg. Um, Bora is uh, mainly famous for its not the largest, but among the largest collections of late Iron Age monumental burial mounds and cairns. And um, most of the area today is heritage protected, as you can see in the picture. Um, it's a recreational park that people use, but some of the area in the back um, is, our, is still in agricultural use. Um, not surprisingly, uh, this area has drawn attention uh, from a ver <coughs> very early stage onwards. So the first investigation that we know of are from 1852 where uh, road construction workers discovered a burial, a uh, ship burial. Um, but uh, there were numerous uh, chest trenches and uh, excavations in the area. I'd like to draw the attention to uh, the latest investigations in 1991, where Björn Müller, who started the Bore project in a three-year project in 89, um, focused his attention away from the burial site or the burial mounds towards uh, potential settlement structures that were uh, discovered or in, indicated by a fo uh, phosphate analysis. And he really uh, discovered some post holes and some uh, cooking pits. And I come to that in a little bit. Um, the geophysical surveys started in 2007 when our, uh, when our colleague Imo Tring, uh, Trings was invited with his Swedish team over to Norway to test um, a single channel pulse echo, <coughs> sorry, uh, pulse echo antenna on some of the areas inside the national park uh, and outside and that was a big success because he found two Viking Age halls, we call them Hall A and Hall B. Um, and the interesting thing is that this is the area where Björn Müller was excavating and he was actually excavating the Viking Age hall without noticing it. We only know that from the geophysics. Um, that uh, draw the attention of others. In 2011, uh, my former institute, the LBI Art Pro, teamed up with two, uh, two Norwegian institutes, uh, the Vestfold County Council and the Norwegian Institute for Cultural Heritage Research to <coughs> Uh, test some motorized uh, mirror system in inside <coughs> inside the park, um, and that was followed by a larger survey in 2013 uh, by a motorized spider system on snow, um, and this time we found a third hall, uh, hall C, larger than the two other halls. And of course, um, if you look at the site that was formerly known as a burial place, some even called it a royal cemetery. Um, if you look at the addition of three Viking Age halls in the vicinity, then this picture changes and we have to ask ourselves whether we look at a new Bore. So that's basically the backdrop against what I want to present today. <clears throat> because not all of the two physical surveys were successful. Um, in 2015, we tried and that, uh, we, our colleagues from Niquitrite, with their newly acquired Meyer system, um, but they kind of produced almost unusable data due to huge precipitation um, um, amounts in the week prior to the survey. Uh, and that um, entailed an investigation that we started in 2016, the Ball and Monitoring Project, where we looked at the areas from Hall A and B and did monthly surveys uh, within the time range of 14 months in order to, to understand the seasonal changes that we see in the data a little bit better. Um, and finally, in 2017, um, the entire area that was possible to, ac to access um, was um, measured with three Myra systems simultaneously. Um, two, two of them were from NICU and one was from the LVI Pro. So that leaves us with an extremely wide range of data sets for this site. Um, that's quite unique, especially in Norway. And um, I'd like to showcase a little bit how we approach this wealth of data um, by exemplifying our interpretation approaches <coughs> um, at the three halls A, B and C. 
One of the first steps we undertook was use uh, image fusion to enhance our data sets and we used the toolbox for ecological image fusion for that uh, or short Typhoo. Typhoo is uh, developed by my colleague Kjet Behoven from the LBI Pro and um, it works basically in merging two or more images by using a mathematical combination of an algorithm and produces a new fused image and this image uh, you can then use to um, further analyze your data. Um, I've said two or more images. Currently, the application is still limited to two images. And of course, that's a bit problematic when you deal with um, an entire 2BR data block. <clears throat> so what we've done was to define an area of a range of interest, which basically is um, the depth in which your uh, Viking Age hole, in that case, um, is located and you then custom <coughs> generate depth slices to, in that case, 40 to 60 and 60 to 80 centimeters that you can, that you can then fuse. That's of course optional, um, you can do that any way you want it, but we got quite some good results with this. Those are the two um, depth, depth slices that we uh, used, and you can see that it's, um, I hope you can see it actually, uh, that the the hole is, is visible, but it's, it's, it's quite hard to see it. <clears throat> um, this is the uh, user interface of Typhoon. It's quite intuitively. Um, you just load your two pictures, set the parameters, choose your uh, fusing al algorithm, and then um, after some time it takes to render the picture, you receive your fused image that you can then export and use its georeference, you can export it and use it in the GIS. Um, the original GPR, <coughs> I'd like to show you some, some comparisons with the original GPR data versus the fused image. We got some of the best results by using the gradient domain overlay, in this case we inverted it, um, but you can also see that Heartlight brought some good examples, screen and also color burn. But of course, again, that's, that's, uh, that, dif that will differ with every site and every setting, and that's certainly something that um, have to, has to be tried with your uh, respective data set. If you compare the interpretation of the original data versus the fused GPR data, then um, we see that they look quite similar, but if we overlay um, the original with the fused interpretation, and we see that there are some red areas that have, hasn't, haven't been picked up by using the fused image and vice versa. We also see uh, date <coughs> interpretation um, features or interpreted features in the fused or originating from the fused data that were not, uh, that were not picked up in the fused data but in the original. Um, GPR data. So what does that mean? It means that um, Typhoon is an incredibly useful tool, but it's not Wonder Woman. It's not a magic tool that will bring you the best, um, yeah, best data set ever. You have to use it very targetly. The second step we undertook was <coughs> to use volume rendering to look at our GPR data in 3D, and in order to, um, yeah, showcase that I made a video yeah i hope you can see that yeah um so we used uh, the application voxel 4 for this um you can simply load your data into this application and there's several features you can use to analyze them it's not an application that you use for mapping per se but for getting a better idea of your data sets and um, what you can do is exaggerate the data to kind of understand or yeah I mean, you will understand it's a 3d data block but um to to get a better picture of it uh one of the best features in voxler is the customized color map which means that you can take target any amplitude values you want to and give it a certain color you can also um set some of the amplitude values transparent so exclude them from your data set and that's very useful, uh, especially in, in the case of the holes where we have very faint traces of the post holes. Another feature that I, I really find useful is that you can 
cut through it any way you want. So horizontal, vertical, but every angle that is useful for you, um, you can actually uh, um, set. And um, if you, for example, want to look at the backfill of a post hole, so basically the section, then it's quite helpful to load vector data that you have acquired by a preliminary interpretation of your hall. So to orient yourself within the data set, and then you can simply cut through your data block towards your um, respective post hole and look at the backfill. I have shown that here, it's just taking a second. <clears throat> so you simply slide to your post hole and then look at the backfill that you can see here. In this case, we've seen that the backfill is very heterogeneous, which was a bit surprising for us and it gave us a little bit more information on um, the holes. Um, another step that we've undertaken is to use multiple interpreters. Uh, we have, th those are my colleagues from uh, NICU and from Westfall. Uh, again, if we look at hall C, uh, it's, not <coughs> it's not too uh, uh, good to see. Um, but looking at the different interpretations of uh, five different interpreters, then you see that every interpretation differs a little bit. And while this is not very surprising, it's still something that we have to consider. Um, yesterday, Dave, um, on Tuesday, Dave Cowley uh, kind of mentioned that the human mind is, is, is like a black box um, in, when it comes to interpretation. And I think that's, that's a very good expression for it. Because if we look at the combined uh, interpretation of five interpreters, then we see that the prominent features such as the post holes, they're all picked out. But the more faint traces that might tell us a little bit more about the billing structure, those have been interpreted quite differently. And then finally, uh, we've also used multiple data sets. We've not just taken the best data set, but we've also looked at the, the, the less, uh, the lesser, um, the lesser good data sets, I don't know, the, wor <coughs> the, wor the, the more worse, the, whatever, you know what I mean. Um, so that's uh, Hall A, and that's the September 2015 uh, data set. I've already mentioned that the precipitation amount was so uh, large that um, these data were almost unusable. And if you compare it to uh, January 2017, a very good data set where it was very dry, you can see this alarming distance between data sets. <clears throat> and again, just a month later, worse conditions, we almost don't see the hall. And then a year later, in the same month, we have the best data set so far. This was actually just taken a month ago on snow. So again, if we look at the, uh, at the comparisons between the different data sets, then we see a good um, coherence with the prominent uh, postal features, but everything else is quite different. So coming to the results, um, we have used or we've tried to use all of this in a combination to enhance our database and to get the best or exploit the maximum of information possible from the halls. And those are the interpretations we came up with. Hall A is, in our opinion, a two-faced hall <coughs> that shows um, a wall ditch. The same goes a little bit for the for us. Hall B was a bit of a problem because it was it didn't it didn't it showed up um, uh, it doesn't didn't show up very well in the data set, but still we could um, uh, extract a two-phase building again. And then finally, Hall C, which is the largest uh, and most detailed uh, Viking hall that we saw in the data, so, um, has could could be interpreted in quite some detail. <clears throat> so coming to to the next steps and conclusion, you can see this huge amount of data that we have from that site, and it will take some time to interpret it. Um, one of the things that we noticed uh, while doing it is that while we applied these different approaches that helped us greatly to interpret the halls, we are aware that um, other, in other circumstances where you either don't have these data or you don't have the 
manpower, the time, the, the budget to do so, it becomes quite um, difficult to uh, retrieve so much information from one side using geophysics if it's not systematically implemented. And in terms of commercial applications, it's almost, it's, it's basically impossible to do so. So something that we would like to see, or we hope for, is that um, applications like Taifu or the 3D um, visualization of GPR data is much more, it's much better accessible. Because at the moment you have to prepare the data uh, and uh, you have to have some knowledge how to use it in order to do so. And um, one of the next steps we want to perform is to test Typhoon much more because we've made some such good experiences with it. And then finally, we're quite alarmed by the, the variance of data quality um, by the different data sets. And uh, I haven't spoken a lot about the monitoring project today, but we have set up the Bauer monitoring project in order to address these uh, differences. And we hope to do much, much more um, in this area in order to um, minimize um, or better understand the seasonal and environmental uh, factors or changes that um, affect our data quality. Uh, because that's really the key if we want to implement it systematically in heritage management as we try to do in Norway. And that's actually it. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and of course, uh, our partners, Ludwig Boltzmann Institute and Nikun in Norway. Thank you. Thank you.